are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Salutations. Welcome to another edition of the Friday Forecast. I'm Robert Phoenix, your host, broadcasting to you live from South Central Texas under the heat of the Scorpio moon, the Taurus Scorpio moon conjunct Mars retrograde Scorpio. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? The intensity is in the air. We are getting down beneath the surface of things superficial or topical excuses, realities, narratives are no longer interesting or even palpable. Nope, we gotta go deep. We have to be deep divers. We gotta get our we've got to get our uh, our scuba gear on and get down beneath the surface of what's happening. And for the next 90 minutes or so, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be going down beneath the surface of what's happening. I'm going to start with a uh, a sports thing, because I know how many of you love sports. Uh, I am and have been a sports fan most of my life, although that is beginning to change. I'm becoming less and less interested in sports because it relates to a facet of our popular culture that I'm, I'm finding to be a lot less interesting. At one point in time, uh, sports was theater. It was drama. It was pageantry. You could see bits and pieces of the human condition buried in sports. And it would come out. Whether it was the Olympics or, or the World Series or Super Bowl or a Sunday game of football. I mean, it was there. There was something inside of the the experience where we could we could meet ourselves under extreme conditions. Yes, I know it it it's a, is an echo of Rome and the gladiators. Of course, it is. Bread and circuses. I get it. I get it. But we don't get to see it personified at a collective level like that all the time. And if you've ever played sports, one of the things that you know is that there is something that happens in real time that is palpable. That you 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 can accomplish something in real time. Pal- you don't have to wait for somebody to okay your project two weeks out and then wait for the budget and all that crap. I mean, that's the one thing about sports – in playing is you get real-time validation on who you are or who you're not. And there's a whole culture that goes along with it, which is not always the best. But that's, but that's it's part of life. It's a slice of life here on this planet. Anyway, 
I'm sharing this with you because I'm watching the playoffs, the NBA playoffs. And for a long time, I have been of the mind that sports are rigged. And in fact, I've, I've had, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kevin, Kevin, uh, Kevin Donaghy. I've had him on my show and he is a, a Brian Donaghy. He's a Brian Donaghy. He's on my show, been on my show. And, um, he's basically written a couple of books about how sports are rigged. And the, the Rosetta stone that he found was that on the back of the printing of tickets for the NFL, it basically says that this is a, uh, it, it's for solely sold, solely and purely sold for entertainment purposes only. This is what, the, this is what it says. This is the disclaimer on the back of the tickets for the NFL. And I'm assuming for every single major sport, which basically says it is not a fair and valid competition. What you're watching is a production. And as a result of that, you are giving your consent by purchasing that ticket and being a part of a production. It is like, it is like wrestling. This is what, this is what sports are right now. It's like wrestling. Totally rigged. So I'm watching the playoffs and the Warriors uh, Golden State Warriors, they're, they're a thing of beauty. When they are on, they have ball movement, three-point shooting. Stephen Curry has figured out that if you can shoot the ball from 35 feet away, that you take the refs out of the game, and the refs have been inserted into games across all platforms of sports. But what happened was is the Warriors were looking to run away from the Cleveland Cavaliers, who were hapless, the league decided to suspend one of their players, Draymond Green, one of their best players. Of course, it has a huge effect. It's a last-minute suspension. He can't play. They lose. They lose at home. Now we go to Cleveland, and for the last three games, as I've been watching, actually two games, uh, the referees have, have allowed the Cleveland Cavaliers to do whatever they want, whatever they want to the Warriors with impunity. Without it, they just do whatever they want. They're mugging them. They're they're fouling them. They're you know, look, and I know that there are people from Cleveland listening to the show. Mark Matheny, good friend, fellow astrologer, listens to the show. And no matter how much of a great fan Mark is of the Cavaliers, he'll agree with me. I know he will. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing the league insert itself, get more money by sending the series more eyeballs, uh, they can promote their star, LeBron James, because they want to promote LeBron James. Stephen Curry, and here's the, here's the kicker with Curry. Now, I've seen a lot of weird videos with Curry, like people claiming he's Illuminati, people claiming he's a clone. I don't really, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe he's Illuminati. But LeBron James is a Freemason, and LeBron James is part of the game. And they want to promote LeBron. Chris, Stephen Curry is a Christian. He's a Christian. And so what we're seeing, he's a Pisces. He's a Pisces Christian. He's sacrificial right now. And he got thrown out of the game last night. He had five fouls. I, I challenge anybody who follows sports to go back in the history and the annals of the NBA Finals where you have – two-time reigning MVP, whoever that might be, Bird, Jordan, Magic, whoever. And I challenge anybody to find a game in the NBA Finals where one of those guys is fouled out. It just doesn't happen. Why? Because the league likes its stars. They want, it's a star-driven league. And yet, their greatest star, two-time reigning MVP, they're kicking them out of the game when there's about five minutes left. And the lead was down to single digits. So what we're seeing is a case of a manufactured reality. And this is why I'm bringing this up. Because at the very least, sports for a while, when I was growing up, it's changed. Was a bastion of a certain type of reality that was for the most part, untainted by 
the political machinations and the psychological subversion that other layers of reality have been consistently prey to and have gotten worse over the years. So now sports has become just like everything else, manipulated, fixed, dysfunctional, toxic, and to, to a large extent, really uninteresting, really uninteresting. And it is so blatant. And if people can only make this tiny little leap that what we're seeing in the NBA finals, you know, Stephen Curry's wife came out and basically said game six was rigged. The you know, people are talking about conspiracy with the NBA. And I know there are things people will say, well, there are bigger fish to fry. Well, that's true. But at the very least, if we could see if there's conspiracy in the NBA, then it's a tiny, tiny leap across a tiny chasm to see that there's conspiracy in other areas of what's going to reality is not just a conspiracy theory. Reality is conspiracy game. And it happens all the time. And what does it mean to be a conspiracy game? It means that one side is conspiring to influence events at the expense of another. That's it which means that there's collusion. And if you don't think there's collusion at a high level in the NBA, and not only just with the NBA, but it's the NBA with Las Vegas and the bookies and the odds makers, if, if Cleveland wins the series, and Golden State was favored, a lot of house money on Golden State. If Cleveland wins this series, guess what happens? The bookies in Las Vegas win lots of money. They take in lots of money, huge amounts of money. Because house money is on Cleveland. Not House money is Vegas money. It's not your money. Your money, if you're, if you're betting on it. So if Cleveland wins, Vegas makes a shitload of cash. They're already at seven games. They've got eyeballs, eyeballs, eyeballs. How many eyeballs do you think are going to watch the final? And it's not just the eyeballs. We go to the, the esoteric level, the etheric level. Think of all the emotions involved. Think of the amplification of emotion. You know, where one side is feasting on the misfortune of the other. I mean, talk about schadenfreude. This is like schadenfreude on steroids multiple steroids. And then we have all our little etheric entities just <laughs> lapping it up. So if we can make the leap with the NBA, we can make a leap with other parts of the world. Now here's, okay, here is what the, the, the devil and the details. This is, this is what keeps people to some extent from really wrapping their heads around the fact that the game is rigged. But the game of life is even rigged, is because they do not want to be part of a culture of blame. They don't want, oh, well, you're just blaming. You're going to blame this. You're going to blame that. You're going to blame this. You're going to blame that. And you really, you know, it's you, you, you make your own reality. Create your own reality. To some extent, that is very much true. But why do they have to be mutually exclusive? You understand what I'm talking about? Why does it have to be mutually exclusive? Why can't we have the ability to call it as we see it and be accountable for our own reality? I don't think, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. In fact, I think they work pretty damn well together. Because once you see what's happening, then you get to create your own reality with the backdrop of what's going on. Because now you know what you don't want. Now we know what we don't want in our world or our society. We don't want it to be rigged. If, hey, how would you like to be somebody who's really into Bernie Sanders? 
you, you, you're a Golden State fan right now because your guy got put into a system that's completely rigged. And, and, and the rules were being rewritten on the fly, just like they were being rewritten on the fly for people that were interested in Donald Trump. This is, this is where we are right now. And so what happens if we call it out? No, oh, you're a crybaby. You're a whiner. Stop being a victim. Bullshit. I say bullshit. Because we need to give truth to power. That's where we are right now. Give truth to power. Yeah. You know why? Because we want to create something different. We don't want that. We are not giving our consent. By remaining silent, we are consenting to a consensus reality that is no longer serving us. Do we always want to sit there and shake our fists at the world and just say, we reject it, we reject it, we reject it? Well, the other side says, we accept it, we accept it, we accept it. No, that's not what it's about. We are untangling ourselves from the knots of our culture. And it takes time. Or sometimes you just take a sword and just hack it and just, and just cut the connection and cut the cord. The people who are engaged in the continued development of the narrative, the entropic narrative, are getting scared. I can tell you that right now. They are getting scared because they're getting sloppy. And holes are being punched in reality, right and left. And if you're open and awake and aware, you will see it. And we are in a very critical phase. I was on my show last Friday, and I talked about how we were in this this place astrologically where Saturn transiting Saturn in Sagittarius was opposite the Saturn of 9-11. And I said, we are going to get another 9-11 type event. And what happened? Two days later, we got the mini 9-11. It was going to be a major 9-11, but something happened along the way. Something significant happened along the way. What was that significant thing? Well, In Santa Monica, there was a guy rolling around Santa Monica with a shitload of guns in his car and explosives, and he got lost, and he was driving around, and guess what happened? He got pulled over by the Santa Monica PD. And this was at the same time that Omar Mateen and his team were in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, There were supposed to be two events happening simultaneously, two events happening simultaneously. And the Santa Monica event got scuttled. And the guy that they, that the guy that they pulled over spilled the beans, totally spilled the beans. And what did he say? He basically said that my team was part of a team. They were CIA. And this was a live event. FBI came in, took over, told SMP, Santa Monica PD, shut the fuck up. This is what happens. So we are in a phase and cycle right now where consensus reality is being manipulated and torqued to the point where there are going to be reactive repercussions. Immediately on the heels of what happened in Orlando, We had the push for gun control like you have not seen before. I mean, it is on freaking fire. Now, people have asked me, do you think it was a false flag? The people die. I think we're at a point now where people are dying. I'm going on the record. And if you don't think that people didn't die, uh, then I'd like to see some proof. And I'm not saying that there were people that maybe did not die, that they were all airlifted. Who died? But I feel, I think people, people died. There was massive gunshots going on. And so what, we, what we're seeing is 
We had a number of false flags where nobody died. Sandy Hook, forget it. Boston Marathon, the only guy that died was Sarnayev. San Bernardino, who knows? Who knows? Ah, Paris, now we're talking. Paris, now we're talking. Orlando. So we're seeing this mix now of what appeared to be kind of, you know, actor-driven false flags to something else going on. It's very hard to understand when, or very hard to kind of chronicle what's happening because all these things are taking place in buildings that are closed off. You would think that that, that uh, Pulse would have video cameras, right? And we get to see the, the footage. That's not the case, though. We haven't seen any of it. But I know people that know people that died in that event. We're in a very vulnerable place. Very vulnerable place. Because we are at a point where people are waking up. They're understanding that the game is rigged. And they are not part of a culture of blame. They are part of a culture of correction. A culture of correction. What is it to be spiritual? What is it? What are the properties of being a spiritual person? We talk about being spiritual all the time. What are the properties? Well, the main property of being spiritual is being conscious, awake, and aware. If you look at the, the, the lives of great spiritual teachers, whether it's Buddha or Jesus, I'm not going to throw Eckhart Tolle in there, but they have a moment where they are confronted by the vagaries of this reality. That is part of the waking up process. They see the distinct dichotomy and the polarity and the duality, and they see the game. And the game on planet Earth has been rigged for a very long time. You're born into a rigged world. And this is the wake-up process. It is not a culture of blame. It is a culture of correction. And what would it be like to live in a world where it was not rigged? We might not even be here. Think about that for a moment. That this world solely exists for you and I to wake up to go through these things. And then there's another reality somewhere else where we get to do something different. And I I think that that's quite true, by the way. We're all here based on agreement, whether we were coerced, whether we decided to drop in, whatever it is. But the spirit, there is a spiritual quality to awakening. And it is not about blaming because then The onus is on you. Once you're aware, once you're awake, if you don't do anything about it, then what? It is the ultimate responsibility, is the ultimate accountability, because not seeing it and burying your head in the sand means that you're living your life in a way that is not fully integrated. You you have not integrated the shadow. And so this is this is where we are, and we're and and there is this major test that we're all facing right now. It's major. It's huge. This is the spiritual test of a lifetime. This is the spiritual test of eternity. I mean, it's going to get played out right before our very eyes, and it may not be pretty. I'm telling you right now, it may not be pretty. Everything that I'm, I'm reading right now is that something is up. Apparently, DHS has called in all of their civilian people. They're in Atlanta for some kind of training. I just saw a, a post where the UN is basically hiring people to do weapons confiscation. 
The Muslims are not the problem. The Muslims are a distraction, huge distraction. No, there's, there's bigger problems, boys and girls, much bigger problems. And so here we are. We are in the gauntlet. I said that last week. It's very difficult because some of us are living lives. Some of us have kids playing baseball. Some of us have daughters graduating from high school. How do you reconcile these, these things? It's very difficult. But the, these realities are getting closer and closer together. And at some point, they're going to converge. And will you be ready for that? I'm not sure any of us are. And this is when our life will begin to pivot in a different kind of way. Because I think life in this domain on this planet, in this version of reality matrix can be different. And we will have an opportunity to do so. It's going to come. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. And the, now, could it happen in a way where we can simply and mentally remove these threats, these parasites, the people that want to contort and twist our emotions and tie them into knots so that we're walking around unable to do anything, access our will, anything like that? Maybe. It'd be worth trying. The power of intention, thought, nobody gets hurt. What if we all just like intended for these people to have a blazing epiphany right now? Let's intend that they have a blazing epiphany and their hearts catch on fire and they have what's equivalent of the past life review. It's like when Saturn is going through the 12th house and they get that. The past life review, they see it. They see everything that they've done and they see the error of their ways and they drop to their knees and they pray for forgiveness. Let's hold that thought. All we need is like two, maybe two or three real key people for that to happen. Because then they become the monkey wrench. And I'm telling you right now, if that doesn't happen, they will continue to move forward. This is non-negotiable. They have one set reality, one paradigm that is in place ready to move and it doesn't deal with quaint notions like sovereignty personal authority no they, those all go out the window because at that level you no longer exist you are a part of a machine a machine consciousness which is what it is so let's hold the thoughts Let's hold the thought that a handful of people that are engaged in this process crack wide open. And they don't hurt anybody. No harm comes to them. Right? We're not, we're not wishing ill will on anyone. What we're, what we're intending and sending out is that they have their own version of an awakening. And that awakening is for greater love, greater consciousness. And they put down whatever it is they're doing, and they walk in the other direction. They walk away. All we need, three or four key people in those situations. To have them fall to their knees. See the error of their ways. It's contagious. Absolutely contagious. It's like, you know, Saul becoming Paul on the road to Damascus, although he's got his own baggage. Because if it doesn't happen that way, this is the way it can happen. I'm telling you, it is the most seamless, effortless, spiritual in quotes, way to impact reality. We're not wishing harm. We're not wishing ill will. What we're intending is for the awakening to occur in people 
who believe or have bought into a program and a paradigm that is based on control, conformity, and ultimately evil, plain and simple. Let the evil be lifted from their hearts. Let's do it. Have that thought right now. Send it right out of your third eye. And let's see what happens. Let's meet back here in a week. And let's keep our eyes on the headlines. And try to understand what's been happening. Or try to have a sense of somebody maybe having a come to Jesus moment in their life. Let, let's see if we can read about that. Because that's exciting stuff. Because if it doesn't happen, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's going to happen on the streets. It's going to happen on the streets. That's right. And we, we, you know, we will be looking at war in America, not abroad, war in America. I was in uh, Colorado um, last couple of days, and I was with Regina Meredith. And we did our shows. We did a show for um, springtime, summer, and then a show for fall. And in the fall show, we were talking about the election. And I was looking at the uh, the planets on election night, which I believe is the 8th of November. It's a Tuesday night. And Mars starts off in Capricorn on election day at 29 degrees, the anoretic degree. Mars in Capricorn. Pluto's in Capricorn. Now, Mars will not be conjunct Pluto. On the run-up to the election, Mars will be conjunct Pluto, and that's heavy energy. I mean, we are Mars Scorpio right now, retrograde, in the 12th house of the United States, things happening behind the scenes, right? Covert activity around Mars-related items and paraphernalia like guns in places like what? Nightclubs. Not, I'm, the nightclub is a 12th house entity. It is a 12th house entity. Maybe on the cusp of the 11th and the 12th. But it's, you know, it says what separates an 11th house entity from a 12th house entity? I'll tell you what, drugs. That's what separates it. So the nightclub, the modern nightclub is like a version of the opium den. Because an opium den is definitely a 12th. The crack house is a 12th house operation. So a nightclub is, you know, it's very close. So here we have Mars, Scorpio, retrograde. The last time this happened was when? Scalia, right? Scalia. So now the, there's the big movement to take away the guns. Anyway, I was in Colorado, and um, I was talking about fall, and... and, and Mars starts off at 29 Capricorn on the left, anoretic degree. Anoretic degree. So what's on the other side? That's Mars Aquarius. Isn't that interesting? So on election day, we have two choices. We stay with Mars Capricorn, which is dealing really with the world, because Capricorn is the world. It's government, business, corporations, the man. Right? That is one model. Mars Capricorn, anoretic degree, 29 degrees. On election night, it goes into Aquarius. Mars, zero degrees, Aquarius. We're talking radical. Mars, violence, aggression. Radical aggression. Now, some of you may know that there have been leaks that Black Lives Matter, which is a front really for, I'm going to tell you right now, it's a front for the Communist Party. Oh, boy. Let's see what we got. One of my buddies is, is uh, it's Robert Bonamo. Let's see. I think he just came in. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, I got to text him. Whoa, so this is really interesting. Um, I'm getting a, a, a text here. Robert Bonomo, some of you might know him. Uh, 
He is a very interesting guy, and he is uh, just telling me he's he's teaching. He's he's you know he's written for Cactus Land, author of a couple books, um, and he is been teaching in uh, China, and apparently he's being deported now. He is thrown in jail for the night. He got stopped, thrown in jail for the night. Now he's being sent back to Russia. Wow, interesting stuff. Um, let me just type this out here. So, um, hmm, wow. I guess uh, I guess he doesn't need to be there. <laughs> I guess that's the, that's the lesson we're talking about. Um, So what does this mean, this, this, this Mars Aquarius? This is radical. And again, I'm telling you, you know, it sounds so, you know, oh, my God, he's a paranoid, paranoid nutcake, right? I'm talking about Black Lives Matter connected to the Communist Party. Well, let me tell you a story. I've told it to you. I've told it before. I lived in Oakland, California. I managed an apartment building there for almost four years. And I used to go to this place where they would sell you stuff, like a version of Goodwill. It's called the Uhuru House. And I, I had no idea what the Uhuru House was, but I would hang out there fairly frequently looking for used audio equipment. I was very into music at that time, making my own mixes and stuff. So I'd go there to see if I could score something every now and then. And um, I became kind of friendly with the people that ran the Uhuru House. Now, the people who ran the Uhuru House, they were all Jewish. There were three of them, Jewish. Two women, one man. And uh, the woman, she became very friendly with me, one of the women. And she one day handed me, well, one day she said to me, she said, Robert, I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe that we're doing this. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, here we are. We're in Oakland. We're selling all this stuff, and people don't even know who we are. And I go, well, who are you? It's, it's, it's Robert, we're communists. You know, we're, we're the freaking communist party. Um, I'm like, okay. And, and at that time, you know, I was pretty sophisticated, but I was also fairly, fairly naive in some to some extent. And and I said, um, in my head, I'm like, well, you know, good luck with that. Are you kidding me? Communist Party? Come on. Well, over time, I've come to realize the Communist Party is way more sophisticated and implanted and embedded than I could have ever imagined when I was living there at that time. Uh, so she gave me this copy of this newspaper, and the newspaper is called The Burning Spear. So here you go. So apparently I was being... I was being courted by the Communist Party, which I, you know, I was being seduced, although they weren't doing a very good job. So they give me this newspaper, and I start to read it, and, and I'm, my mind is blown because really what it was was it was talking about how people were not in alignment with the goals and the agendas of the, of the Communist Party there in Oakland, and that they were being outed by doing something different. They were being publicly shamed. And the whole newspaper was about public shaming, which is, I guess, what happens when you're a communist. You get shamed because you got to toe the party line. Isn't that where the phrase comes from, toeing the party line? So I was very, you know, over time, I've come to look at that experience and the Uhuru house has just gotten bigger. I've come to look at that experience and the experience is, um, let me talk, let me, let me do this. Let me play a little bit of music and let me, let me, let me come back here on the back side of the break and, um, and, uh, and I'll share a little bit more about how the two things are connected. What do I want to play here? Oh, boy. This is always fun for me. 
a little Todd Rundgren. It's a short break. Todd Rundgren, dream goes on forever. You're listening to the Friday Forecast. The dream goes on forever. What is the dream? That is really the big question. And what is the dream we all share? And what is the dream we would like to have together? This is what we're working through, sorting through, walking through as we head up towards the general election on November 8th when Mars is in Capricorn at 29 degrees representing the old guard or the old way of doing things. Mars goes into Aquarius that night, which is radically different and new. Black Lives Matter has come out and said that they plan to start riots. This is, this is the intercepted communication. That the goal here is to start riots and to suspend the process, the, the electoral process, so that the uh, commander-in-chief can remain there for as long as they see fit. And we know that he is connected to the goals of the UN, the 2030 agenda, which is about thinning the herd and getting people off the land and getting people into megalopolises. This is the this is the goal here. And if I could tell, if I could, if I could give people a prescription to eradicate this goal, it would be to get get on the land. To, and to get some land and to make a go of it. And I know that the BLM is hassling people in Oregon. They've bought up huge chunks of land in Western United States. There's still plenty of land available in places that are not very populated. So this is a, a way that we can counteract that. But the goal here is, again, based on the intercepted communication, to have as many conflagrations on election night as possible to suspend it all so that we can have a prolonged process. And in that prolonged process, we have a transitional government and we are the United States for all intents and purposes is over. We're really close by the way, to being over already. I mean, ever since nine 11 happened and the Patriot Act came in and basically overwrote the constitution. We're, we're, we're pretty much pretty much done. We're hanging by, by cat gut, literally. So this is what's happening, and this is what's happened with Orlando. Orlando, it was it, the, one of the first, you know, all these other events have been small planks leading up to something major. And I think that this was supposed to be something major. And it was big, but it could have been bigger because of what didn't happen in Santa Monica. I just put a piece up on my website about the Orlando event. There's some very interesting um, events that took place historically on June 12th, which is when the Orlando event happened. Operation Orlando is what I'm calling it. So if we go back through history, we look at just a few key events. 1942, Anne Frank receives a diary for her 13th birthday. Of course, the diary becomes the, um, the codex, really, for the Holocaust. And that's an important cipher. 1963, civil rights leader uh, Edgar, Ma- Edgar Evers killed in front of his home in Jackson, Mississippi by KKK member Byron de la Beckwith. So now we have the Codex of the Holocaust on 1942, and we have the, basically the, um, the Gulf of Tonkin moment for the civil rights movement, both on June 12th. Nelson Mandela sentenced to life in prison, June 12th, 1964. Here comes the Mandela effect. 1978, David Berkowitz, son of Sam, sentenced to 365 years in prison for six killings. 1996, Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman killed outside of her home in Los Angeles, California, which, of course, initiates 
one of the most famous public trials in the history of the United States, which is being played out right now on ESPN in a five-part series, turning O.J. Simpson into a political prisoner for all intents and purposes. But on the 12th of June in 1997, this is where it gets really, really interesting, Queen Elizabeth II reopened the Globe Theater. The Globe Theater is where Shakespeare's plays were performed. And in Shakespeare's plays, there were women, but the women were played by men. And what is one of Shakespeare's greatest lines? All the world's a stage. And the stage was the globe. This is the metaphor for the globe theater. Reality is staged. It is a staged affair. And there are various levels of staging. So we have this transposition of the sexes. June 12th. Now, who started the Globe Theater? Good question. Um, but the next puzzle piece is in 1992. There was a film released by Sally Potter. Here, it made its U.S. debut in terms of its theatrical run. It had been in a couple of film festivals. Debuted on 9192. But on June 9th, 1993, Orlando, Orlando, the movie Orlando debuted. That's three days before June 12th. The next day or the next debut for Orlando was in Ireland. And that was on the 11th. So we have the 9th and we have the 11th. That's the day before the 12th. The premise of Orlando, well, Queen Elizabeth I, played by Quentin Crisp, who is a man playing the role of a woman, England's favorite queer, Quentin Crisp, author of uh, The Civil Servant. And the, uh, he is the, uh, the figure, the personage that Sting sings about in the song Englishman in New York. Quentin Crisp. So playing Queen Elizabeth I grants young Orlando the gift of extreme longevity so he could learn and grow in wisdom. Orlando is played by Tilda Swinton. Tilda Swinton goes from being a woman to a man, a man to a woman to a back to a woman. Man, woman, that's, yeah, man, woman, uh, man, woman. So there's this intersexual um, evolution transformation that goes on with Orlando. So the film Orlando connected to Queen Elizabeth I, connected to Queen Elizabeth II, connected to Shakespeare, the Globe Theater, all the world's a stage, the intersexual interspersing of identity. It's all there. This Orlando event had it all. And then you throw on top of it you know, again, let's just go over it. You have, you have the Codex for the Holocaust. And so the, the, the language that's being used for what happened in Orlando, by the way, is like the LGBT Holocaust. So we have that. We have the civil rights piece, Medgar Evers. We have Mandela, the civil rights icon. We have Nicole Brown and uh, Ron Goldman. Connected to OJ, again, now being turned into a civil rights cause celeb. It's all part of the June 12th, part of the codec. And then we have Pride Week, and we have Rama. Boy, it is packed, huh? It is really packed. And it's all with that Mars Scorpio retrograde. We have to uncover it, though. And we have to see it as yet another event which is manipulating our consciousness and was staged. Look at Omar Mateen. He was an actor. He was in a movie. Apparently, he was trained by the CIA. His father was meeting with the State Department, has his own radio show, TV show, was poised to be the next president of Afghanistan. He was in a movie called The Big Fix, which was about the BP oil spill. He, played a, he was a security guard. He's on camera. Who is this guy? First, he's a, you know an angry uh homosexual hating Muslim and now he's he's secretly gay can't you know self-hating 
I mean, come on. This, this, this is wild stuff here. It's all there. You have so many agendas. It can all just be, you know, force fed through this one event. And I'm telling you, you know, we have to be aware. We have to wake up. We have to call for what it is. Because if you don't, you consent to it. You consent to it. Now, you may not, you may not do so on, on an inner level, but you are silent. You are in silent consent. And not everybody is willing to do it. People say that I'm brave. I don't know. Uh, am I? I'm just doing what I think I need to do. People tell me to watch out. You've got to be careful. There are bigger fish to fry, let me tell you. Way bigger fish. And I'm not advocating any kind of violence. I'm not advocating anything like that. I don't even own a gun. How about that? What am I advocating? I'm advocating that we insert a new program into this reality. And that program is for people, key people, to have a moment of conscience. A moment of conscience where there is something greater overriding their psychopathic programming. And they are able to see themselves in the monitors of their heart and their mind. And they walk in the other direction. That's what I'm advocating. That's what I'm advocating. You and I, we're good. If you're listening to the show, unless you're a caller, you want to tell me I'm full of shit or fear monger or whatever, there are people on hold. Maybe I'll take some calls. Um, but if you're listening to the show and you listen on a regular basis, you're good. You get it. I'm not saying that because you're listening to my show. I'm saying that because I know a lot of you people. I know where your hearts are. I know where your heads are. You're good people. You're not bigoted. You're not closeted. You're not racist. You're not xenophobic. What you are is fair. And you're just looking for a fair shot, a fair shake, a fair chance in life without the corruption, without the manipulation. And I'm, t- I'm here to tell you, you're not, you're not asking for, for too much. Trust me. And you're awakening to the fact that what's been going on has not been fair at all. It was fair to a point. It was fair to a point so that this paradigm could be built, which is the Western industrial complex, the commercial complex. And once, you know, the half percent made a shitload of money, they decided to close the game down here. Because What you don't want is you don't want an underclass getting economic power. Because once an underclass gets economic power, then they can be a threat to your position. Give them enough, but only enough. And then shift it. Move the cheese. And this is what's happening. So now people are waking up. Where, Where did my job go? What happened to my job? Where did my funding go? Where did my speech go? Where did my kids go? Where did my daughter go? My daughter's now a boy. What happened to her? Oh, I can't talk about that. I can't have an opinion. They may, they may take my daughter away from me. They may take my son away from me. Because I've got, I've got an opinion that does not mesh with the prevailing vox populi. Does not consent to the consensus. Well, I'm here to tell you that you're okay. And people will say to me, hey, I'm, you know, I'm glad you have your show, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, you feel like, I feel like somebody, uh, you know, get, gets it. I don't feel alone. You're not alone. Let me tell you, you're not alone. There are millions and mil- there are millions of people like you. And there are more coming online. And this is what scares the shit out of these people. And they are having to move their program ahead very quickly. I don't care what you think about Donald Trump. He has been an accelerant. He has been an accelerant. And and to that point, he is dangerous. 
He may or may not make it as president. I don't know what kind of president he's going to be if he does make it. He could be great. He could rally and create something unified finally for, you know, because let's, let's just, let's just call it as we see it. Right. Let's go back to the 1960s. Let's go back to the Vietnam war. Let's go back to the place where Perry Ulander got a dose of enlightenment. The heat was on America. Once Kennedy was killed, and I believe he was killed. I'm sorry. I don't think he was. He left and decided to go hang out with his lover and, you know, go live in some island somewhere. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's the case at all. Sorry. But even if it was the case, the damage was done. It's as if he w- did die. So I don't, you know, it's like splitting hairs. Because after that event, America became a different place. You know, everything, the Kennedy assassination is the apotheosis of America. That's what it is. And then we have Johnson, Great Society, and it's really the the birth of socialism in the United States. Johnson, horrible president. Horrible. And from that point forward, we had the Vietnam War, and the hate was on. The hate was on for America. You know, we hated, we hated our soldiers. You know, if we didn't hate them, we supported them because it was the American thing to do. Well, even that was probably a wrong position because that war was a bullshit war, as most of them are. Maybe the one that might be coming to the streets of America, that won't be a bullshit war. No, it won't. That'll be fucking real. But let's just... uh, hold that space, that it is not coming to America. But we have to be, we cannot stick our heads in the sand, people. The clock is ticking here. I'm telling you right now, it is ticking. So either we affect what's about to happen on a quantum level, or we be prepared for what's going to happen here real time. But America became a country of scorn and derision, hated, tolerated for the most part, hated in many instances. But we stood for something. People wanted to come here. It was a place where they could latch on to a dream in a place where they couldn't have one wherever they lived. Now that's being used against us. Nine eleven rolls around. What do we have? We have sympathy. Sympathy. Oh my God, America, poor America. Yeah, they're assholes. Yeah, they're arrogant. But this should never happen to anybody. Sympathy. What do we do with that? Why don't we go invade countries? Let's go invade some countries. And for the next fifteen years, let's bomb the shit out of places in Afghanistan and Pakistan in Syria and Iraq and Libya. Let's just bomb the shit out of them. And let's create a lot of casualties. Let's get people really angry so that at some point in time we can bring them to the United States and, you know, let them deal with their anger. And what's happened is that worldwide we have become the police force of the world and the general opinion of America is not good. But at one point in time, it was. And at one point in time, you may think it was a storybook or that it was a grand illusion. It was, it was fake. You show me anything, anything. You show me any country. I don't care. You show me any country in the world, and I will show you that there is uh, the same issues, if not worse, with any country globally. There, there is, there is, there is no, there is no pure or virgin land to stand upon when it comes to this. But I understand why. So here we have the potential for some form of unification. This is, at least, this is what Trump is talking about. Whether or not it'll happen, I, I don't know. He's too unpredictable. But this is what. 
on some level, it's what the country needs. The country needs to be unified. It would never, it will never be unified under a socialist banner, because what happens with the socialists and the communists is that there's always something more to do. We're almost there. We're almost there. We're almost there. We're almost there. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. What the fuck are you fighting for? It's already gotten here. So I'm rambling a little bit, but this is where we are now. And um, this Orlando event is key. It's critical. It's real. It's it's we we are witnessing the uh, maximization of thoughts, the maximization of theater, press. It's all happening. It's all happening right now. So keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, keep your heart open, keep your heart open. That's the hardest thing to do during a time like this. So easy to shut down. So easy to just crawl into a, a you know, a hole somewhere. I, I understand it. I totally get it. You know, I don't have a lot, I don't have a lot in common with popular culture anymore. So I, I'd be very okay with checking out and creating something different and new. And hopefully we have the opportunity to do that. That would actually be really exciting. It's created a very different kind of world. And a world where we're using things like 3D printers and we're making things and, and we're growing things and we're working less, but we're having more as a result of that. It's a radical concept, um, but it's, it's very possible. It's quite possible. That's the world that I'm holding out for. Because I'm, I'm ready to let go of this paradigm. It's over. It's spent. You know, I'm ready for something different, new, interesting, dynamic, fun, creative, passionate, rel- you know, self-reliant, accountable. There's no culture of blame in this model. None at all. We're not looking to blame anybody. We want to take responsibility and accountability for the type of world that we want to create, not the type of world that wants to be given to us and that we become a part of because people are are rapidly, not even slowly, rapidly rejecting that world and that model. Highest rate of suicide, men between 55 and 60, you know what the next highest rate is? Women between the age of 53 and 57. They're rejecting, they're rejecting in ways that are not helpful. Um, I'm not sure how much more, more I have to add. I've been talking here for about an hour. I think you've got the gist of it. Everything from here on out is just going to be uh, icing. Why don't I do this? Maybe I should take a couple of calls here. I wish I had a call screener. Who knows? If you'll jump in here. Why don't we take a call? Somebody's around. Let's go here. Who's been holding the longest? I think this person. Let's put him on the air. Hello there. Hello? Hello? Yeah, hi. Are you just listening, or do you want to call in and chime in? Oh, my God. Robert, I didn't think that you were talking about me. (laughs) Um, Well, who do you you think I was talking about? No, well, in some of these black talks, they call out the last four numbers of, Uh like, so you know, you know, you know what to do. Oh, yeah. I think think they, they basically will say unmuted, right? Oh, right. That's, I okay. think that's, so, yeah, I think that's, that's, last that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to, to poke you and just say hi to you and say that I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And it really does make, it's really overwhelming, like, just living in these times. <laughs> and you do feel alone. So it definitely, you know, it definitely feels feels better. I, I did a reading with you not too long ago. I don't know if you remember me. Um, it was it was a little bit ago, um, but a lot changed since then. Like, everything was going well in my life. I had a lot of um, options and things happening, and things were going really good and lining up pretty well. And then, literally within a month, it all collapsed. <laughs> in on itself. And I guess you, I know you were telling me like I was I'm good I'm the trust in my long term planning and all that. 
Texas Capricorns are big long term planners. Um so I don't know, I was just like I wasn't sure like what happened, you know. Um but there's just a lot of awakening I guess going on. Yeah, I mean it's 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 it feels problem. volatile. It feels volatile almost. Like you think things are going well and then the rug gets pulled up from underneath you and you have to replan all over again. Yeah, I mean that could be you know I mean, astrologically, from a, a larger perspective, we're dealing with the outer planets, you know, they're either mutable or they're cardinal. There's no fixity right now. No fixity. So, you know, what, what does that mean? It means that we're dealing with conditions that are changeable, in flux with cardinal energy that is catalyzing a high degree of mutability and change. And that's, mm-hmm. and that's on a collective level. It's also on a personal level. Um, if you look at the chart for Orlando, it's a brand mutable cross. Brand mutable cross. Um, so, you know, we're in that in the crosshairs of all that mutability and change. So we have to be nimble, and it can be really frustrating, especially if you're kind of in a good wave and a good patch, and all of a sudden things change very quickly and we have to kind of you know reinvent ourselves on the fly and deal with the flack of you know some kind of incoming you know um jolt of transformation you know I'm always, I'm always curious like how you energetically like balance yourself like being so like up to date and in the know as to what's going on um, and then, and still be able to maintain your optimism. Cause like, I try to do that too, but I find myself like completely turning off the news. Like, I don't even really know what's going on. I don't think I even heard about the Florida thing until, I don't know, months later. Cause I don't even watch TV anymore. And the only time I hear the news is from other people reiterating it because well, it's overwhelming. Is- it's this overwhelming. Is why, like I, yeah, this is why cable news is dying, uh, and and alternative and internet forms of news are proliferating. However, these events are like crack for cable news because you stick glued to your TV. I don't. I got I got rid of cable, and you're not alone. And I advocate people unplug from from mainstream media, mainstream news. I totally advocate that. It's nothing more than mind control and stealing your signal. And the only reason I do what I do is because uh, for me, I kind of, I'm like a filter for people and I can filter this through me. And if I didn't do the show, I wouldn't be able to filter it. I wouldn't be able to move the energy. I wouldn't be able to transmute it. I would hold on to it and it would be, you know, fairly dark to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. So this is an act of creativity that allows me to, to sort of turn this into, for lack of a better term, kind of a little piece of mutable art that exists for about an hour and a half at a time. You almost and, have to like um, talk about it outside of yourself in order to keep it, you know, from consuming. Like that's what I do when I'm talking about it. I kind of feel, try to keep myself, like, connected but disconnected at the same time. Yeah. You know, like, I'm I, hearing and I'm taking what people are saying, but it's like I'm taking it in, like, oh, that's that's a funny thing that's going on in that reality over there. It's like something more that I compartmentalize with something outside of myself so that I don't give energy to it, you know? Well, you I don't know, know if that's I mean, a good way to handle it. Well, no, I mean, I, th- I think we could take that to another level and bring it into a spiritual context, and that's non-attachment, right? I mean, you're practicing a form of non-attachment. So you're being able to step back and see it from a, a different angle, different pr- perspective can be a higher perspective. I mean, if you wanted to play that game, you could go up five or six levels interdimensionally, and it's, it's, it, it would be akin to, you know, um, paramecium, 
you know, basically swarming around, you know, a, a petri dish. It's, I mean, it's what it would look like. So there's you know a spiritual lesson, a spiritual lesson in there, yeah. and you're, you're activating a spiritual principle, non attachment. You know, the thing that I guess. Um, concerns me the most is I feel like a lot of this reality that, um, that like you were just talking about is connected to my parents' generation, whom obviously I love very much and I want them to have their whole reality and they're content with their life. This whole system, the voting and the politics, it's like they know it's bought out but they don't want to acknowledge it fully because they don't want it to fall apart because it served them and it served their generation but it's not serving our generation. In fact, the seeds that they planted on the rise during their generation is coming back to bite their children is what's happening. So I have a hard time trying to come to, like, a consensus with, like, my father. You know, just like the, you know, main people, like my father, my mother, my aunts, my uncles that are all around from that generation in time where, you know, property was at a boom and they were flipping properties right and left and they were making so much money and everything in their retirement, you know, were age 50, 55, whatever. And like, they're living pretty well and they want to hang on to this system. They don't want, and it's like, in a sense, I, I understand. Sure. It's, it's like a, it's a, it's like a, it's a, it's like, I respect how they feel about it because in their reality, like there was good things that happened in that generation too. You know, you had Martin Luther King, you had, you know, women's rights, and, like, they lived through some of these things. They remember them. And so there was, like, you know, the hippie movement. If there was positive things that happened, they were more freer, certainly, you know, than, than, we, than we have right now. And they do see problems with it. They acknowledge there's problems, but they want us to all still participate in the same way they did. Like, they were, you know, trying to get me to vote and all this stuff, and I just said I wouldn't, I just uh, don't believe in giving my power away. I'm like, I believe that if you're going to use this capitalistic system, if it is rigged, but if you're going to do anything immediately in your reality to use against them, you vote with your dollar. You create a demand for what you want in the world. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and obviously you, you, you speak up and you stand up, you know, for what you believe, um, but not, like you said, in a badly intended way. So I'm like, I'm frustrated because I feel like, I feel like there's a breaking point going on. I feel like my dad's starting to open up. I feel like he's starting and my mom are starting to open up and, and know that, yeah, there's some players in the background that are manipulating stuff. And I, and I, I feel like they're more open, but not open enough like yet, but it's like coming. I like feel it. I don't know. I well, feel like when it's, they when they it's coming when they to come an impact their, soon. Yeah, when they come for their pensions or their 401ks or their savings, they'll wake up real quickly. Because that And I don't want them to suffer that. By, by that time it'll be too late. And don't think that that couldn't happen. Because at some point everything is in play. And by the way, all the systems are rigged. The socialist system is rigged, the communistic system is rigged. They're all rigged. Capitalism, as far as the systems go, probably to some extent, maybe the least rigged for the first, I don't know, third of the 20th century. And yeah. then, and well, then, what, and then the it, deregulation though. came in. The deregulation came in. And you had the free market traders, and it became a, 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 a form of globalization, industrialization, and corporatism. And at that point, the ability to raise yourself up by your bootstraps and be self-sufficient and have a business became harder and harder and harder for a number of reasons. So, um, but still you would have a, a better chance in that system than, say, in a communistic or a socialist system, which is where you are told what to do. You have no opportunity to self-determine. So we're getting very close to that, by the way. That's coming. I know. And if, it's funny. It's, it's a nice thing, too, that there's already people that have worked out, you know, theories and, you know, different ways that we could, you know, navigate this paradigm and live in a different way without money. I mean, there's Jacques Fresco. There's, 
I mean, I'm not saying that he's, you know, that that's the right thing, but it gives us ideas to think differently, you know, about about how we can do this. So I'm 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 totally on board with you. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready for something new. I'm ready well, to let this let's, go. Let's hope for something new is something that we have a say in and that we are accountable for. That I'm all for. Um, There's the something new where uh, we're, we're being told what's new and that right. if we don't go along with the program, uh, something that something new doesn't interest me a whole lot. Um, well, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to put you back on hold. We got about 10 minutes left and I may, I may chime in with one of these other callers. Well, thank you for, for, for uh, picking up the phone and listening in and, and uh, chatting with us today. No, thank you. And I, I very much appreciate the spiritual work you're doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Let's take one more call here quickly. Let's go down here. Your phone is unmuted and you're on the air. Are you just listening or do you want to talk? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, hi, Robert. It's Jean. Um, oh, no, oh, hey, I'm, Jean. I'm, How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I hate the time lapse. Um, I'm doing great. I'm enjoying the show. You can't uh, hear it on the computer, though. And, really? Uh, yeah, I, I tried to send you a message on the chat thing, but uh, I called in to listen to your uh, insightful wisdom. Now, let's see. What are my thoughts? He, he puts up in the chat room on Dolores Canyon Cannon's uh, view mm-hmm. of the earth dividing, like what, two earths, two, are you talking about two, two, well, uh, the reality? Well, when you, yeah, you were talking about, you know, how, how, uh, if we projected, then they could change their minds and, and perhaps wake up. Yeah. And when Dolores Cannon talked about how the, how the earth, the, I guess the vibrational frequency of the earth would divide and the people who wanted to stay, in, in the reality of uh, chaos and strife could do so, and the rest of us might ascend to a higher uh, level of awareness. So, yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a necessary problem with that because reality is pretty permeable, at, especially at this point. Um, but, yeah, I mean... <laughs> It could, it could have, it could happen. I mean, all of a sudden, maybe we could wake up and we're in a different place. I mean, I don't, I don't right. think that that would be, you know, out of the question. I'm willing to entertain the possibility. Wouldn't um, that be a lovely thought, though? Theoretically, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and my kind of overarching philosophy is that there cannot be two types of let me just let me see if I can simplify the language. If we are vibrating at a particular vibration, not frequency, at a particular vibration, we're all vibrating there consistently, meaning we're holding the space, right? Every single moment. If we're vibrating at that level, and that level is love. And love is not just, you know, it's not just like airy fairy love. There's, a, there's like, you know, real hardcore love that has to say no sometimes, but, but it's, but, right. but it's connected to a higher love, which is saying yes to a much larger picture. If we hold that space and we're not knocked off our perch by these bullshit events, at some point that vibration will be too strong and too high for people who are not willing to live in that field to hang out here, that they will uh-huh. not be able to energetically deal with it. I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, Gene. I have because I'm a man, and I believe women are closer to love than men. And, I, and I, 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 they just are. Men, this is the lesson that men have to learn. But I have had times in my life where I have been shown tremendous love um, both personally and even divine. And I have had at times a very hard time accepting it. Because it, right. was, almost too, it was almost too much. It was almost too overwhelming. Yeah. 
you know, because, because that is the spirit, real spirit of love. It is so powerful and so profound that if you say yes to it, you no longer exist. The person uh-huh. that you were no longer exists. And the issues and the struggles and the foibles and all those things that make up the drama of our experience, they all go away. Uh huh. And so how do we redefine ourselves after that moment in time? It's very different territory. Most people can't Why? handle that. Edgar Casey talks about, you know, planets as consciousness. And that after you, you move from this world, you go to these different planets and you get to experience uh-huh. consciousness on those worlds. And he talks about Venus. And Venus is just pure, indescribable love. Nothing but love, 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 love on Venus. And uh-huh. it's, it's so intensely loving that most people can't handle it. That you have to, you have to kind of graduate to go to Venus. You go to Mars to deal with conflict. So uh-huh. this, is, this is what we're talking about. It's, it's this kind of love. Because at that level... The, the, the darkness can't, the, it either has to submit to that kind of love or it, it, it literally just, I think, exterminates itself. Right. So if we get to that place, and that's a, that's a you know, challenging place, but that's where it's at. And then, our, and then who knows what kind of world shows up at that point. Well, let's all pray and, and hope that it's, it's the better world that we're hoping for. Well, it's already here. Mo- it's, that world is already what? here. This is, this is, yeah, well, this is what we don't understand. It. it is already right. here. And what we, what we don't have is our conscious awareness of it. Right. It's all around it's us. Right. Have, the have you ever seen the... Be... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Have you ever seen the movie Astral City? No. It's based on uh, channeled work by um, a Brazilian. It, it, it's their version of Edgar Cayce. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in fact, I think you can watch it on Gaim. But okay. uh, uh, it's called Astral City, and, and it's a channeled work about a doctor um, on Earth who lived his life very similar to what you're talking about, these people. And he dies when he dies on an operating table and when he wakes up in the next level and it's all the things he goes through and why, um, you know, they call, they, they considered him a suicide because of, of his, uh, the way he lived his life. He was, you know, self-centered and he didn't do very, no compassion and one thing after another. And it's the story of his evolution. And when, when he finally awakened in that level and he turned around and was able to communicate with this man uh, on our level and uh, he channeled these books. And so I think, in fact, he channeled probably over 40 books to this man. And, we, mm-hmm. you know, we've never heard, we've never heard of this man. I'm, I'm racking my brain for his name. Uh, but he... He wrote over 400 books. You know, they're all in Portuguese, and you have to read, watch the movie in subtitles, but it's a fascinating story. And there's things like this going on all over the world that we've never even heard about. You know, well, other, other uh, people, there are... Astral City, huh? Yeah. Oh, it's a great movie. Okay. Well, you could go join Guy on TV and watch... All kinds of interesting stuff there, including uh, my interviews with Regina and my old shows. They're still on there. Um, Gene, I'd love to chat with you more, but my show's about to end. Well, thank you so much, Robert, again, for all of your insight. I really enjoy your program. Oh, you're welcome. It gives me something to do, so I love doing it. (laughs) Uh, Excellent. Yeah. All right. You take good care. Tell Madeline I said hello. Okay. Bye. All right. Well, that's uh, that's about it. We got about a minute and forty-five seconds left. Minute forty-two left. So let's end the show on a positive note. Stay strong. Stay supple. Stay sweet. Stay soulful. 
and uh, let love rule. And you know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'll be back on Sunday night with 11th House. We'll get into the uh, this full moon coming up here in Sagittarius. Speaking of Sagittarius, here's Phil K. Dick. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.